All right. We're going live. We're connecting to the places that we need to connect to. I'm just making sure. Awesome. Looks like we're working on YouTube. So if you are joining, let me know that you can see me. Let me know that you can hear me. It does appear that I'm everywhere I'm supposed to be, Facebook and YouTube. Awesome. And so we've got some people joining. We're going to talk about splitting behaviors down tonight and the issues that come up surrounding that. Just let me know that you can at least hear me. If you can't see me, I'll just turn the camera off and we'll have a, a podcast type chat. But uh, hello, I'm getting some highs. So does that mean you can hear me? You can see me? There we go. People are finding us now. Excellent. So we're on Facebook and audio and visual works. Cool. Awesome. All right. There we go. Now they're coming in. There's just this tiny bit of a delay in the comments. Um, so I, I played around with this last week and I don't know if it helped, but do y'all like the setup where the comments are off to the side as they come in or do you prefer how facebook and youtube uh logs the comments because i can turn that function off i um i was i tried that out when i needed to read comments um from when i didn't have my computer and my phone i tried that out but i have both so i can like I can get rid of the comments on the screen, I think. Anyways, let me know what you like. Um, okay. I asked in the group recently, uh, we were supposed to talk about this last week and it, it was just not a good week. Um, so we postponed and we're talking about splitting tonight, but I asked, you know, what what issues come up uh, when we're talking about splitting behaviors. Um, let's see. I can, like, I can take away the chat too. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Um, because I, I suspect that, like, the chat still shows up on Facebook like normal. But, um after the fact, maybe not while it's happening. All right. So anyways, I move, I removed the chat from the screen. Um, thank you for your feedback. Uh, so let's first talk about all the ways that we can break down a behavior. Um, because this, is, this comes up commonly so <laughs> raise your hand if you've ever said but they do it perfectly at x location they do it perfectly at home they do it perfectly at class um but you go to somewhere new or you go to somewhere um a little bit just different it doesn't even have to be new you just go somewhere different um maybe you're in the same location but you're on the other side of the ring you're um the obstacle that you're working is somewhere else in that facility. Something about the location has changed and your dog's behavior has lessened. It's regressed. It's not going the way it should. And I think this happens to us a lot because the, that is a part of the behavior. Uh, I think the we the better and better that we're getting at training, we're starting to look at more and more of the details that go into that training session. I still don't think we're putting enough credit 
on the environment of that situation. And now you're probably saying, yeah, but I, the, the behavior, it's so inconsistent. I can go to class one week and it's perfect. And the next week it's not perfect. Come on, Megan, something, when do I get consistency? I know how frustrating it is, but there are some things about the environment that we cannot perceive. Um, there are some things that our dog brings to the table that we may not be able to perceive. Um, we may not be able to perceive if they didn't sleep well last night and they're kind of tired today, or they didn't sleep well while you were gone at work and they're tired now that you're at class, or that maybe their tummy hurts and they're really just not all that interested. Uh, they, they really want food, but their tummy hurts, so it's affecting their performance. There are some variables that we can't see, let alone control. So regardless of how good of a splitter you are, we always have to fall back on if the dog isn't able to do it, they aren't able to do it. It's not that they don't know how to do it. It's just that they, they don't know how that moment that day, okay? In that context, you might not know what that context is, but they aren't getting it wrong on purpose. So remember that. You're also not setting them up to fail on purpose. Um, there was a lot in that comment thread about um, you're bad at it, right? Like you're a bad, uh, bad planner of the training sessions. You're a bad splitter. You might not be, right? You might be missing the things that you cannot see and you might be missing the things you cannot directly control. So keep that in mind, okay? As you move through any training plan, know that if your dog answers incorrectly twice, they're telling you very clearly, I don't know the answer. Being able to, and then you have two choices. You pivot to something different, a different degree of that same behavior, or you just end the session. If you, sometimes I don't know what the pivot is in the moment. And I just have to end the session. And that's okay too. All right, so you're not a loser if you have to end a training session. You're not a loser if you can't figure out um, what needs to be changed. You're not a loser if you can't find that common ground in getting a consistent behavior, right? It can happen. So we're going to dive into some different things. Mm, he's going to keep barking. If I leave, it's because Torch's tantrum has not subsided and I'll move him to a different room. I'll give him a minute though. He's doing some complaining. And it's, anyways, I don't even know if you guys can hear him. Um, so the things that we are looking for, think of your splitting. Um, maybe you've heard this analogy. I know I heard it, heard it from somewhere, but splitting is every behavior has a lot of dials, right? You got to turn one, you can turn one down, you can turn one up, you can turn all of them down and turn one up. So think of everything that's going to affect that behavior and every criteria of that behavior has its own dial, right? So if you're teaching the dog to sit, you've got, you, you, are, you have the behavior, but you can increase duration. You can increase um, your distance from the dog. You can increase distractions around the dog 
like is there a food bowl open next to them or is there a toy on the ground or is there another dog in the room is there um is there another person in the room you also have the room that you're in right you can be in the living room in the kitchen in the front yard in the backyard in the training facility in the competition facility so you have all of these dials and generally speaking if you're going to crank one up that's going to be your fo your focus of the session and all of those other dials can be turned down a little bit while you kind of hyper focus on this one and your behavior you know if you're in the if you're going to keep you're going to be in the living room you're going to be teaching sit and you're going to in you're going to crank up the dial on the distractions then you're going the next day then you're going to move location so you're going to dial back on the distraction bit right but you're going to keep maybe the duration about the same between two let's say two and five seconds you're not going to be dialing up on multiple variables at the same time this might feel tedious um if you've taken if you've taken my weave pull class it's like if every behavior you teach can be kind of taken apart like that because in that weave pull class we focus on just entries right entries under distractions entries with handler motion entries with this handler position entries with that handler position and then we get just four straight pulls it's a separate split right when we're working on building up the number of pulls we take out those really complicated entries we don't focus on um, entries that are not really really solid yet we stick to the dogs easiest ones the ones that are going to make the most sense because i'm going to increase the duration of the weave pulls and that's the main focus that's where i want to see the most progress in that session and then when i have those two pieces then i can combine those i can keep the duration dial turned up to four poles and i can add back in the entry dial right and then once that's really solid i can maybe go to obstacles before and start cranking up that dial and things like that following me following me how splitting works and how you might progress a training session or a behavior i'm gonna pause and go take care of torch i will be very very quick you probably can't hear him but it's distracting me and I was not prepared for this level of distraction. So be right back. Okay, that poor sweet baby Skittles had snuck in with him um, and was just lying there staring at him. And he was like, you're my friend. I need to be with you. Okay, I'm back. Can y'all see me again?
it will absolutely feel like you're building a huge checklist. Huge. Massive. Yes, exactly. Poor Torchy. Pretty sure that's you, Sheila. <laughs> Poor sad baby. Um, I was like, he never screams this long. What is the problem? And I go in there and Skittles is deaf. So she can't hear him. And he's just barking at her. And they're like their best friends and barking. He usually barks at her when they play. So, um, yeah, that was very sad. She can't hear it. She was just staring at the door. Um, and he's barking at her behind him. <laughs> um, okay. Do, 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 do. All right. So, yes. When you're building out this behavior, it's going to feel like a pretty... A pretty big checklist because there's all these little things that you can you can be training okay um but taking this sort of staggered approach to it so like you have a behavior and you're um you know you're gonna get duration and then you're gonna build in um the distractions a little bit at a time the progress actually goes quite fast because then you're able to interlock those pieces of the behavior. Right? And this is really what we need when we're looking at agility behaviors that have so many different uh, variables, right? So there, there's all sorts of, you know, like running dog walk exits that we need, but we don't need to, we don't have to train them all at the same time and we don't have to train each piece on the full dog walk we can split that apart and give the dogs the idea of the behavior on the flat and on a low plank and on a low dog walk so that when you take it to the high dog walk it's familiar so splitting gives you that ability to break things down and show the dog in small doses the concept of a behavior so that when you put it into the bigger picture, it's familiar. So a really good example is most of my station work is just the concept for start lines and stop contacts and the table. My station work is about stopping out of motion and staying until you're told that you can go. So if you come in, if one of my dogs comes into contact with a station, they should wait there until they hear a word that means go. So we talked about it a few weeks ago during my puppy talk about one of, it was one of my top 10 behaviors is the stay put versus go. That is essentially a, a tiny split of start line training, stopped contact training, and table training. But it's a concept that can be split down even further. And so then it, it that's how it can move quickly. Okay. The smaller you split things, the more quickly you can progress. So raise your hand if you're like, oh my gosh, how did they get that far that fast? They must be training like a hundred hours a day every day. We've all had that thought like, oh my gosh. Well, of course they, they have access. They can just train all day, every day. And if that, that's why they're there. That, that is a way, but I think really smart trainers are able to progress really, really quickly because the behaviors are split finely enough. Okay. We also have to remember that making it easy isn't cheating. This has never been said to me, but I have these thoughts. Maybe it's my imposter syndrome. Maybe it's my just general paranoia of people not liking me. Those are the same thing, right? Um, I always feel like, especially in the very 
first couple of weeks of my classes, I get this feeling that everyone thinks it's way too easy and that it should be more difficult and that they shouldn't be nailing it and that maybe they're not getting as much out of my feedback as they hoped because I'm like, yeah, that looks great. That's perfect. You're doing it. You're killing it. That looks great. Go on to the next step, right? Wow, this is great. I would change this one little thing and then you can move on to the next thing. The, they're getting it, okay? It should feel easy. Perhaps that's the actual secret is that if it feels hard, it's not broken down enough. Okay. If it feels like you can't progress either within that training session or the next training session, it's not broken down enough. I want to be able to change something in every single training session that I do. If I have to repeat the exact same training session again, the exact same, nothing different. Why? Because, and should I be repeating that exact same training session or should I be trying to see if there's another, another piece there? Is there another dial I can play with? Okay. So making it easy isn't cheating. You should be able to progress pretty quickly. There's a video I want to, I, I'll post it in the group. Um, yeah, it should feel easy. Training shouldn't feel hard. If it feels like you're fighting and you can't get the, get the behavior that you're looking for, then the dog doesn't know what you want, right? especially when we're trying to build up new behavior. The dog can only access behaviors that he's previously been reinforced for, either from you or the environment, right? The, we, we can only access the things that are already there. We don't access new behaviors out of nothing. We access new behaviors through approximations of other behaviors right? Because look at a down, for example, I, I lure a down, but I don't get my, the first time I lure the down, I don't reward for the butt on the ground. The first time I reward for the nose following the cookie down, right? So the splits of that down, I'm going to lure the, the cookie's going to be in my hand, and I'm gonna take their nose down. And the very first time they get their cookie, it's when their head drops. And I'm gonna do that once or twice. As soon as their head drops, I'm gonna give them the cookie. And then they're gonna stand back up. I'm not gonna get the down. They don't know a down. The down isn't in their repertoire yet. They don't know to offer the down. I need to put it there. Then I cookies back on their nose and then I'm going to lure their head down and then I'm going to wait for their elbows to drop because that's going to be a natural progression for them. Most dogs are very quickly going to fold back into a down like that. Within one session, you're probably going to have a lure down with a cookie in your hand, right? But that's not where you start. You don't start with this rewarded just the whole down. Why? because you might get a bow and the dog stays there. You might not get the butt drop. And I don't wanna wait the butt drop out because I don't want my down to look like that. I don't want the down to look like dink, one, two, dink. I want the down to look like really, really fast. So I don't wanna wait things out when I want the behavior. I want to reward for what the dog's capable of giving me. And then, and over time, when the dog gets the idea, oh, stand up, stand up, stand up. It will come, but without those splits, it might not come as quickly. Or you might get the dog in a down, but if your goal is a fast down, don't wait them out. Don't let them stay in, how do I get, don't let them stay in this half down bowed position and just wait for it. No, no, no. That is also, that's maybe the next secret. Don't wait for it. Split for it. Okay. Don't wait for it. 
approximate towards it, okay? So if it's not happening, there needs to be another split in there. How are we doing? I want to make sure that I kind of cover everything that y'all mentioned in the Facebook group. So I'm grabbing that up. Um, there was definitely a question I remember about when to progress. So remember, it should feel easy. Your training session should feel easy. So your success rate should feel high, should be really high. So you should be able to increase one of those dials every single session. Okay. Most of us don't have dogs like Shrek where he needs every single variation shown to him. He doesn't interlock variations very well. Okay. So if I want to increase one dial, I have to turn all of the others back to zero. And then I have to go up again. And then I can move to another dial and turn that one back and move up. And so then I, you know, so I have to go through all the variables and then I can increase one variable at a time, bring it back down. One variable at a time, bring it back down. One variable at a time, bring it back down. And then I can start again with all of the dials at one. And then I can start again with all the dials at two. Um, he requires all of the things be shown to him. Most dogs can go, oh yeah, I was working at this thing at a three and everything else is kind of at a two. I can totally, I can, I'm fine. I understand. This is how the game is played. The game is played consistently everywhere and they kind of interlock. So it's, it doesn't, it doesn't always take as long as it sounds to get there. But if your dog says, hey, hold up, wait a second. You left all of those dials at four and you're cranking this one up to a six. I would like you to bring all those other dials down to a two. You have to do that. Um, does that make sense? I want to make sure I'm grabbing... Oh, getting stuck, not progressing, not progressing at a split. I, I would like to hear a little bit more as to why you feel like you get stuck at a specific split. Like, what keeps you from moving on? Um, not planning it well enough ahead of time. I cannot stress this enough that most of your training time should be spent planning your training sessions. Um, I, it, it's just how it should go. I spend a couple of hours um, on most Sundays. I've been kind of in a training bleh, the last couple of weeks, but most Sundays, when everything's going well and how it should, I spend a couple of hours and I make my little checklist of what I'm going to train. And then I review any notes of those training things from whatever classes that I'm in or um, things that I'm taking. I'll read the relevant material. I'll watch the relevant videos. I'll make notes if I need them because I work really well if I take notes on the material that I watch or read, I'm likely to remember it. Then I don't really review it during the week, the videos and the lectures and stuff. And sometimes that works out. And sometimes I review the video and I'm like, oh, wow, that's not at all what the instruction said. Sorry, teacher. Right? It's just how I work. And it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's really okay. Um, but I, I make that list so that when I go to the agility field, I am rarely there for more than 20 minutes working my own dogs. Maybe half an hour if I have to build the course, right? So like I'll set something up, I'll work each dog for like five minutes. I might work on my own skills for about five minutes and then I'm done. Um, so 
planning exactly what you're going to do is the is a much better use of your time and your dog's time. Um, I'm gonna grab. Are you in favor of back chaining a problem sequence before the training run, or let the dog run entire sequence and see what happens? Um, this is a great question. If we're gonna swap to sequencing, I think sequencing should be split um, according to your pay grade. So if I like, if I were to show up at a class and the course is way above my pay grade or my dog's pay grade, there's no way that I'm going to run it and see what happens. Because if it's above our pay grade, I kind of know what's going to happen. Okay. So I'm only interested in running sequences that I know that I know how to handle and the dog knows how to respond to those cues. Okay. Otherwise it needs to be, those behaviors need to be taught to the handler and then to the dog. Um, so I'm absolutely in favor of back chaining some sequences or starting with the part of the course that you aren't sure about. And then once you've trained that, if then you want to put it together into a bigger picture, have at it. Okay. Um, but I am a big, 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 big fan of not overfacing handlers. Um, good question. Okay. Um, going back to the comments from the thread in the group, finding the second split, the next step, but not jump all the way back to the original behavior. So this kind of sounds like um, where you thought you had enough splits, but then you found out you needed to do a little bit more. And it might be going back to the original behavior. So this sounds a little bit more like ping ponging to me, where, um, and that a good one is to think about uh, wing offering for that one, because so we it's very, very common especially in agility, harder, make it 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 harder. And that's not accounting for all those dials. So if I make one thing harder, like my distance from the wing, I might choose to make something easier by rewarding closer to the jump. So instead of rewarding X to my side, so now the dog has to go the whole six feet back to the jump. I might be six feet from the jump, but reward three feet from the jump. And so now the dog only has to make a, de a decision to turn around and go three feet away from where they were instead of coming all the way back to me. Okay. Um, so there's splits like that, but there's also ping ponging like, okay, I've just moved. I started at four feet. They nailed it. I moved back, did a couple reps at five feet. They nailed it move back. They're still doing it at six feet, but they've slowed down pretty um, dramatically. They're thinking about it. The latency has increased. The dog's doing it. They're getting reinforced. They're correct, but it's not at the same fluency that it was at four and five feet. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me don't keep backing up. And I think this is where this is where we get it wrong and we think that we've missed a step. And I don't think we've missed a step. I think we haven't gotten it to fluency before we moved on. So I want you to think about latency as a form of fluency. If your dog was um, offering a behavior within one second, when you were three feet from them and you back up to five feet and suddenly it takes them three seconds to think of the correct answer. It's great that they did think of the correct answer, but that doesn't mean they're fluent because they've already told you that they can access the answer within one second. So now that's the criteria. They've said, I can do this within one second. If you then, Incre if you increase a dial and you lose uh, that in that fluency, that reaction, that quick reaction, you can't keep increasing the dials because then what's going to happen is we're going to fall off a cliff. 
and we're not going to get the behavior anymore. And then, then we go back too far. We go back too far. And then we never pump back up again. So that's where ping-ponging, going back and forth between um, a couple of dials can really help, right? You, your dog's getting it right, but you're seeing an increased amount of latency. They're slowing down. Their reactions aren't as sharp. So you make it easier for a couple of reps. You turn down one of those dials and the dog's like, yes, I love this. And they're like, bam, 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 bam. Great. Go back. Go back to where it was, like immediately in that session, if you can. Do you still have that long latency? If you still have the long latency, then then maybe you've missed a split. Maybe there's something that you can break apart even more, some dial you can play with. But most of the time, the dog's like, oh, yeah, I got this. This is super easy. And now you've solved it. Still following me? Still doing okay? Any questions coming up? I'm going to go back to the comments. Um, one of the comments, and I think several of the comments um, were getting creative with how to split. This can come from experience as well. I don't necessarily have a formula for how to split, where to split. But if you kind of break down everything that could affect the behavior or everything that you want to affect the behavior that will help you a lot um uh, that that will help you look for splits where you weren't previously looking for them um and hopefully that helps i know it's, it's an unsatisfying answer um another comment from the thread was getting that first bit the smallest possible split like the first step or the first bit of head movement Okay, this a little bit depends on what kind of trainer you are and what kind of dog you have. A lot of times we can get, we can label the dogs that they're not, they're not good at shaping or they're not good at luring or they're not good at, like they're not good at, they're not very operant. <laughs> you can see how I feel about that statement. And a lot of times, eh, I mean, sometimes, Sometimes it's not the shaping or the luring. Sometimes it's the application of the shaping or the luring. Getting that first step, that first split, has to be something that the dog already possesses in their repertoire, right? Um, and sometimes that means we lure it to make it happen. We need to put it into their brains as something that can be offerable, right? So I start a lot of my behaviors as luring, right? I start wing offering as a lured behavior. I start tunnel offering as a lured behavior. and pre But I get rid of the lure fast. So it's a really, um, it's a communication system that I use often enough. So once the kind of, once the puppy catches on, they can apply it to a lot of things. Um, I lure the down and then I change it to offered really quickly. Same with the sit, same with the stand. Um, <laughs> same with the weave bowls. Actually, I, I lure the first weave bowl gap too, now that I think about it. Um, I lure a lot and then I get it on offered behavior because I don't want to create frantic dogs that just offer a whole bunch of stuff without thinking. Um, okay, back to the comments. I, yeah, Megan Riddle, I think, has a dog like Shrek who needs every single dial and variable of the dials spaced out and shown to them and say, look, this is the same thing. Got it? And they're like, yeah, I do. But if you skip a dial, they're like, uh-uh. I don't understand anymore. It's really funny. Um, keeping sessions short and remembering where we are in the split to keep progressing. Okay. I said planning the training should take more time than training the training. So also the, like, the only thing I need you to do after training session is to 
write down where you ended. Just write down where you ended. You don't have to, to do anything else. Just write down the very last rep that you did, the last successful rep, because it's okay. It's okay to end on a mistake. In fact, if it's not going better and you've run out of food and your dog is tired and you are tired and it's not getting any better, just quit. But the last thing you you do before you put, you know, you're out of training, out of the training room is write down what you ended on because then you can just start there next time. Right? Just start there next time. Um, okay, that kind of falls in with the next comment, forgetting where you left off. That's why you're going to write it down. Um, Diane is feeling overwhelmed by so many options. So much. I, I get there too, because when I, when I write out that flow chart, I'm like, oh dear. <laughs> and then you get into the training process and you're like, wait, I could do this variation. So absolutely. That just, it, it is overwhelming, but it's also exciting because it means that you can do a different training session every single time. So then you're not going to get bored and you're certainly not going to get stuck. Um, uh, going back to the chat, I have a young girl, brilliant weaver at home, full speed entries, will not leave anywhere else. I've opened the channels at the training facility. Um, how can I split this further to help her generalize that weaves are weaves? So where else have you been? You mentioned home, you mentioned training facility. Where else have you been? Have you been to different parts of your yard? If you have front yard versus backyard, what about um, a very quiet, maybe your neighbor's yard? Like you just share a fence. Like, I don't know. You got to split that environment. <coughs> you got to find an environment that she can work in and can she do other things in um, that are similar to the weaves. And then if you really have to... If you really have to um, split things, sometimes when I go to a new environment, I have to just show the dog that, look, training here is the exact same process and we just have to go and can you eat food here? And then we go home. And then can you take your leash off, run to a cookie jar, put your leash on and get cookies? Like I just have to like do so many other things in that environment before I can do weaving. Okay. So Shrek is, Shrek is with you on that one, but there are probably other things that you can split down for her. Um, making sure I grab the comments and the chat. Finding my split should, and then jumping to, okay. So going, so then when you go back, you're welcome. Um, you want to make sure that you don't leap over any splits that you've already planned. Right. So sometimes with ping ponging, uh, you might leap f forward a little bit further than you wanted to. And then, the, then you run into failure again. So you just bounce back and you find that sweet spot and then you, you start building up again. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but it's fine. The idea is that if every time you increase criteria or bump, change a dial, your dog can't do it. There's something that you haven't found. Um, sometimes it's our mechanics. Sometimes we've changed the cue and we didn't know that we've changed the cue. Okay. When you change the reinforcer, you're changing part of the cue. So you need to be aware of that. So what I mean by that is if, the, if you were previously rewarding something from your hand, 
when the dog finishes eating, they're in a different location relative to you to be able to start the behavior, right? So if, if you feed from your hand, your dog's at your side, and then they're able to offer the behavior from your side. Then you're training, 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 and now you're rewarding from a bowl six feet away. Well, now the dog to restart the behavior is across the room. You've changed the cue. And so that might have been too much of a leap. Maybe the bowl should have been a foot from you and then two feet from you and then three feet from you and then four feet from you and then five, right? Like that in and of itself can sometimes be part of the problem is that you've changed how you're rewarding the behavior and now you no longer have that behavior because when you change the reinforcer you are changing the cue of the behavior and that was just recently reiterated to me and my mind just kind of was like oh yeah yeah like it's one of those things like you know or i i like when when i heard it i was like yeah of course and then i sat there thinking about it some more and i was like Oh yeah, <laughs> I can see all the potential problems that could come of that. Um, trying to figure out where, where the behavior fell apart. It could have been in how you were rewarding it, changing the cue. Um, okay. Ask questions y'all. I'm running out of things to say off the top of my head, but I know y'all have questions. Maybe it's about a specific behavior or a specific split, like we just talked a little bit about weaves. Um, what else do you want to know about splitting? Uh, I, I feel like to do this, I, I think a really good as assignment, um, I have a... I have one video in mind that I think I would like to share. I'll put it in the, in the group is find trainers that you admire. They, they're good trainers and they post their training sessions and, and see if you can find the splits and the progressions without asking them because sometimes they're very, very small something about the cue, maybe hand placement, reward placement, um, starting point of the dog, things like that. I think if we, you can watch a session and see the small differences in how the behavior was acquired and how the behavior was rewarded and how the behavior uh, happened, you can, you can see a lot. Um, then pay attention. So then, right. So Try that the first time and then watch the video again and watch the dog. Did the dog maintain the same level of like, let's use labels, speed, enthusiasm, um, interest, latency, right? Did they maintain the same level throughout? Did they did it did all of that kind of get worse and if it got worse what did the handler do in response and if it got bet if it got like the dog's doing it harder faster better stronger blah 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 how did the handler respond to that because watching it might give you some some better ideas about it Questions, drop them in the chat now. Can you um, clarify me a little bit more about what you mean by getting set back? 
like if the dog gets confused or and you have a setback explore that for me just a little bit more sue yeah i think we don't necessarily have to do it to learn about it. I think if we put a little bit of effort into watching some training videos and observing those training videos, taking some notes about those videos, um, it might help you more in your planning stage, your planning phase of training. Because um, there have been times, so it is, it's interesting, when I'm taking a class, I very frequently will write out the steps, like each repetition that I want to do. And I'll take that like piece of paper or a whiteboard and I'll take it with me to train because the steps aren't in my head because it's not my exercise, excuse me, or it's not my curriculum, right? It's not something that I'm used to doing and I'm trying to do it, you know, for the instructor, how it's um, laid out in, in their class. So I will write like every repetition down how I'm going to respond. And I don't try to pivot all that much. I'll just like, all right, these are my 10 reps. This is what I'm going to do. And we're just going to see how it goes. And then I can take that information from there. Okay. When I'm working on something that I'm super fluent with, I'm super familiar with, it's my, it's my own thing. Um, I, I'm still, I still have a plan but I make those adjustments kind of on the fly. So whichever category that you're in, it might do you some good to just plan out 10 reps. This is what I'm going to do for 10 reps. It doesn't actually matter how it goes um, because it's only 10 reps. If the dog, right, like you're not going to get all 10 wrong, right? Or if you get two or three in a row wrong, you could just go ahead and scrap that training session and just go ahead and go back to the whiteboard and figure out a different 10 reps to ask. But if you've put in some time to plan those 10 reps, they're probably gonna go pretty well. But if there is something that didn't go well, then you can look at the video, make adjustments, plan another 10 reps, okay? But eventually you'll be able to do that on the fly. But if you don't do it at all ever, you're not gonna be able to do it on the fly with the dog in front of you. Okay, so there has to be that space for plan, do, review, reflect, plan, do, review, reflect. You have to give yourself that opportunity to learn it, to do it, to be able to do it, right? Um, I don't expect all trainers to be able to pivot and respond and see everything um, and, and notice the ear flick, flick or notice the very slight decrease in latency and blah, blah, blah. That's advanced stuff, being able to observe all that in the moment. But you do have to teach yourself how to do it. And teaching yourself how to do it means putting more effort into the planning and reviewing phase than the doing phase. Um, okay. On fading the treat, dog drives hard through weaves to get a piece of white cheese tossed on the line after weaves. Do I ask for another behavior after the weaves and reward that, then progress more obstacles and reward? You can. You can forward chain it. Um, sometimes that's good. So this is what I kind of meant a while ago about saying changing the reward strategy uh, can mess with your behavior. Um, so when what I like to do when I'm, when I'm first training obstacles and when I want to move the reinforcer behind a second obstacle is I'll back chain it. So if I've previously been doing weaves, cheese, weaves, cheese, weaves, cheese, and now I want to do weaves, jump, cheese, weaves, jump, cheese, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the, I'm going to set the course up. It's going to be weaves, jump, cheese, uh, weaves, jump. That's going to be the course. And then I'm going to put the dog in front of the jump and I'm going to do jump cheese, jump cheese, jump cheese. Okay. So now I've told the dog the reward is coming after the jump. The jump is what accesses the cheese. You already know how to weave and weave holes are super rewarding because you've been getting cheese for those. But jumps are also 
and access a, a route to cheese. So then after a few reps of jump cheese, jump cheese, jump cheese, I'm going to go maybe six weaves, six weaves, jump cheese, six weaves, jump cheese, six weaves, jump cheese. And if that's going well and my dog's not exhausted, I'm going to go 12 weaves, jump cheese, 12 weaves, jump cheese, 12 weaves, jump cheese. And the dog's going to be thrilled. Um, generalizing. My bop can weave when she's on my left, but when she's on my right, it's like she's never seen them before. Struggling, where to split, break it down. Since, um, in my mind, I know she can weave. So she can weave, but she can't weave when you're on the other side. So at what point did that happen? Did she, so, um, did she learn how to weave all on one side and then you swap sides or did you start at like two poles? So at what point did she start to tell you, I can't weave when you're on the other side? Okay. Because that's the point we have to find. And that's the point we have to go back to. It's, I have no idea. I'm not saying this about you in particular, Cheryl. What I'm thinking is that this happens a lot in agility where we train a behavior all the way to, uh, and it happens a lot in weaves, is that we train to 12 weaves. Okay, so the dog's weaving, 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 and then we start throwing in distractions. And the dog's like, I've been weaving for seven months and you've always been standing still, throwing my ball forward 17 yards after the poles. And now you're gonna start running, okay? we need to be changing the picture pretty frequently, especially in agility behaviors where the picture changes pretty frequently. It felt like that felt a little bit, um, your question enacted some passion talking. Um, so back to there, that requires splitting at every single level. So when you're doing just, if you're, if you're training with two by twos, at two poles, you want to throw in a bunch of distractions and, and layers of things at two poles, right? And then you want to build up to four poles with, you know, easy conditions and then layer in all those distractions at four poles and then get to, you know, six or eight poles, depending on how you're going to add, and then layer in those distractions again. And the dog's like, oh yeah, that's familiar. Yeah, yeah, you total, you rear cross me all the time. You front cross me all the time. You, you do that. You run off and do cartwheels while I'm weaving all the time. It's normal, it's familiar. But if your dog um, is doing a behavior and doing a behavior and doing a behavior in the exact same conditions for an, a length of time, it's going to be much more difficult to make any changes to those dials. Um, and I think this happens. It came up in the comment thread about getting stuck. And I think we get stuck there when we stay at one particular split for too long. So I want to be changing something every session. I don't want to do the same session twice. Opening cans is like the most aversive sound to me, but I can't like, it's worth it. It's not the most, I can think of another sound that is the most aversive sound to me, but opening a pop can is pretty aversive to me. That's so weird. I'm also pretty sure that a pandemic has made me realize that I'm a noise sensitive border collie. Because all noises bother me now. Pop cans, especially. All right. Any last minute questions and or last minute request for what I'm going to be talking about in June. I'm attempting to sign off before my phone dies completely because I didn't realize um, that I didn't have any battery, but it's on like 2% right now. So if I go dark, I'm really sorry. 
Um, but I do want to make sure um, that I grab any questions. Um, Kadeen asks, if you train something but then realize you need to go back and do some additional training splitting, how far back do you go? Um, to the point that the dog is successful at the level of success that I want to see them at. So if I'm going, if I'm looking for additional splits because I saw a huge drop um, or huge increase in latency. So a huge drop in the dog's confidence. They're, they're taking, you know, five or six seconds before they're able to respond and give me the behavior. I'm going to go back to the point of where I was getting that, that behavior really snappy, really, um, excited, confident. Um, and then I'm going to see how I can layer in and go up again from there. But I, I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go back just enough to see the see what I want, and then and then go again. I wonder. Give me a sec. Keep the questions coming, and we'll wrap this up in a second. Um, Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in. So we'll wrap this up. If you've got ideas for what I should talk about for the rest of June, you can drop them in the group, you can drop them in Patreon. Remember that um, the Patreon page gets video analysis of the small space setup. So what that means is every week when the Facebook group gets the small space set up, the Patreon group gets a voiceover video of me kind of doing like a virtual walkthrough um, of that sequence. So we talk about the dog's reality lines and potential things to look for in the in your handling and, and things like that. Um, the All patrons get access to this. So you could just join at the five level tier. Um, and then the $20 a month tier gets an additional monthly live training demo where at least in the summer, um, last, just last week we did May's and I went to the agility field and I did some training on the agility field, uh, and it, it worked out really well. So that's going to, that's in the higher level tier. Um, otherwise, Thanks for coming. Thanks for your questions and your comments. And feel free to keep the discussion going in the group. And I will see you all next week.